So Dr. Mead is still on Thunder, right? He's all on that, right? <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, she did still on my Thunder. So we're going we're to have a class review when we do this. And when I do these talks, I think back to my seventh grade teacher, social studies teacher. Um, we were studying the Civil War, and she said, you worry less about the names and the dates and the battles. What I'm interested in is whether you understand the whys and the hows and the themes. So we're going to go through a lot of data. Dr. Mead shared a lot of data with you. But I'm hoping what you take away are, what are these big challenges, questions, and themes that we're struggling with here um, in this debate? So one of the major things going on is that Wisconsin specifically, but the country in general and the world at large, is looking increasingly different. And it's manifesting itself both in terms of our diversity, but particularly in terms of our economics. <clears throat> So this map shows a change in the rate of poverty. It's measured by free reduced lunch over time. Except it's not over time right now. This must be the PDF version. Let's go. OK, imagine for a minute <laughs> that this chart gets dark. Because it does. You'll see it in a minute when it's frozen. And what you're going to see is that a decade ago, 21% of the kids were eligible for free reduced lunch. And this year, 43% were. So in a decade, the poverty level in our school doubles. Okay? And that is particularly true in the central band of Wisconsin and the north and western parts of the state. And it, it compounds many of the academic challenges that we're seeing. If I step back next to a map that also theoretically should change, and you'll see in a minute, of what's happening with our enrollment. So if you think of enrollment as kind of a fixed situation, we have about the same number of kids over the last you know, 10 years. In 2001, a third of our school districts were in declining enrollment. And last year, two thirds of our schools are in declining enrollment. So we have the same number of kids. It's like a balloon, right? And I squeeze two thirds of that and make it smaller. What has to happen to that other third? Right? It's got to get bigger. So what we see happening is this movement of students and families all across the state. And it's largely a suburbanization. Those areas of the state that are getting increasingly poor have fewer people, less job opportunity, fewer workers, fewer students. And the areas of growth are largely concentrated in suburban areas surrounding the UW campuses, actually. That other thing that's kind of getting changed in the budget. 75% of our students are in 30% of our school district. Three, four, three out of every four kids are in 30% of the school district. When you look at Wisconsin, we're actually mostly rural as a state. So half of our school districts, 55%, when you look at the bottom there, have fewer than 1,000 kids enrolled. At 80%, we're still looking at less than 3,000 kids. And then we have a handful of big districts. So when Dr. Lee was talking about that constitution, it didn't say you're entitled to a free and appropriate public education if you live in a place where there's lots of people or an area that has lots of property value. It means everybody, everywhere, all the time. And when we stack the two maps next to each other, and these are the end results, the one on the left is the change in enrollment. The areas of green are where we're growing, the areas of pink are where we're declining, and the map, I guess it's on the right, um, is poverty. And you can see how dark those areas get. In the conversation we need the legislature to engage in is, what does this mean for us, and how are we going to meet that challenge? And this is not just an education issue. If you're interested in transportation, economic development, whatever your issue is, this map tells you something about what the challenges our state, face, state is facing. And this is not just in Wisconsin. I can do this map for almost any state in the country and see a very similar phenomenon going on. And we have to meet those challenges. That is the great call to our leaders, our policymakers, to move us forward. The other thing that's going on is we have growing levels of homeless students. So back in 2003, we had about 5,000 homeless students, documented homeless students. And then in 2012, we had almost 17,000, right? A huge increase. Half of those students are in 10 school districts. Half of the homeless students in Wisconsin are in 10 school districts. OK? And that's true of lots of things. Let me blow your mind for a minute. Half of all dropouts in the state of Wisconsin are in one school district. Anybody want to guess which one? 60% are in the 10 largest school districts. 80% of the dropouts are in 40 school districts. We have about 424 school districts. So think about it. 80% of the kids that drop out are in 10% of our school districts. We have a statewide problem, but 
but we don't have an every district problem. So when we start to think about our interventions, our calibrations, our challenges, these are the conversations we need folks to be engaged in. Dr. Mead also talked about the challenges of poverty, and this graph's a little hard to explain. So on the y-axis, all my math folks, right, that's the vertical one, and then the x-axis. So the y-axis is the level of poverty, 0 to 100%. And then along that bottom horizontal axis is how those schools did on the school report card. Okay? That dotted red line is the average rate of free or reduced lunch, and the black line is the line of best fit, or the correlation between poverty and achievement. So those red dots, those are all the schools that are in the lowest performing category in the state. What's the first thing you notice about where they are on the graph? Every single one of them is above the state average in poverty. All. If we look at the schools that are in the highest category, right now we're going to call that the five-star category because they change it. Almost all of them are below the state average in poverty. There's about a 70% correlation between poverty and achievement. That means all other things being constant, 70% of a student's performance can be linked to a socioeconomic status. How mom and dad do at home, right? That gut check makes sense, right? We know that kids that struggle, who have issues at home, trauma, all sorts of things going on, it's harder to learn. What we don't always understand about what's going on in the economy is we've known for years that we have systemic poverty, particularly in our urban districts. We hear the stories about Milwaukee, and you think about the Beloit's and the Green Bay's and the places that are far away. But we sometimes forget about all the poverty challenges there are in the rural areas. And we forget how many people are falling out of that economy. Pew Charitable Trust did a study that says one in three families fell out of the middle class in the Great Recession. Maybe dad lost his job or mom had a health care crisis. Those were students whose parents read to them in the morning, the middle class, they grew up with early childhood education, but now they're facing challenges and trauma, changes in their lives, right? That's where we see issues with alcohol and other drugs, truancy, dropout, disengagement. Many of our gifted students are disengaging in school because other things are going on. At a time when, during that Great Recession, we cut over 3,000 educators out of our public schools. You'll see that in a later slide. Those are guidance counselors, social workers, um, librarians, art music fiat. The things that engage students the most, the time when they need them the most, are the things that we now have the fewest of. That doesn't seem like a smart strategy for meeting the challenges that are in front of us. Now, I also want to be clear that we talk a lot about poverty, but poverty does not explain all of the achievement gap. So, Wisconsin's a great state performing overall, right? Leader in ACT, AP scores, the issue leading graduation rates. Overall, we do really, really well, but we also have the largest achievement gap in the country. Okay. Now, poverty and race are related to these issues, but if poverty could explain the whole thing, if you look at these two charts, so WSAS is the state assessment, the old WPC, right? Which everybody loved, right? Like the new test, too? <laughs> I mean, you have third ones, right? right? I'm going to keep bringing them to you like one. Um, eighth grade math. Third grade reading, right? So this is a little hard to explain, but the sort of black line across, okay, those are students who are white and are economically disadvantaged. Okay, so low income white students is the bar. Each column are students of the different racial groups Asian, Black, Latino, or Hispanic, White, Native American that are not economically disadvantaged. These are our middle class and upper class uh, kids of color. And what we see in eighth grade math for Native American students and black students is that those subgroups, those kids, even if they're middle class or upper class, perform worse on the assessments than their white counterparts who are low income. Right? Crazy to think about. But like I could be a middle class is a group, African American student in eighth grade math can do worse than the low income white students. If poverty was the sole determinant of what was going on, that could happen. Okay, we see the same thing in third grade reading, not as stark, but so there's more than just poverty going on. There are challenges in communities, there are systemic issues that are in play, there are instructional pieces that we're missing, but there are many challenges that we face in our school districts, and I think what we're asking for is help to change those and tackle them. So we talk about schools, this is a school we're in one, right? But a school is a building. Some places hold schools in church, you can hold school in a storefront in Milwaukee, you can hold school in a building here. You can educate kids in lots of places, theoretically. When we talk about how well a school does, what we're talking about is how well did the kids actually do? Right? 
right? That's what we're really assessing in the student's performance. And when we look at the composition of where kids are going to school, predominantly in our lowest performing schools is mostly our kids of color. So this graph shows that the blue areas are where all the white students are. They're in all high performing categories. The kind of teal colors are Latino and the green colors are black students. They are predominantly located in the slowest performing schools in the state. So that relationship is intense, it's targeted, it's located, and if we don't tackle it, we are not going to succeed as a community. One of the charts I don't have in here is that when we look at the future of Wisconsin, project out what we're going to look like. Okay? Most of our uh, enrollments are fairly stable, particularly in all the racial groups, but the Latino population doubles every 10 years. It doubles every 10 years in most parts of the state, it doubles every 10 years statewide, it doubles every 10 years across the country. I live on the far edge of Madison. 55% of the kids in the Madison School District are kids of color. Any of you ever walked around the state capitol? It looked like 55% of the people who work there were folks of color. So when we think about what the next generation of leaders, of workers, of our community is going to look like, when I'm out in rural schools, I'm up in northern Wisconsin, there are two communities in these town association folks, right? So my local government folks. And they're talking about the challenges that they face. And this guy raises his hand and he goes, well, I'm really concerned about all the illegal aliens that are moving into our community. I said, okay, it's not the term I use. But okay. So let's talk about it. And I said, okay, so you have a community, what's going on? Oh, we have this canning factory, all these folks move in. And I said, okay, so you're a community that's generally older, declining, doesn't have a lot going on, but you have this new factory that's opened up and a lot of people are moving in. I said, how many of the other communities have it? I'll shake their we're declining more. We got too few people. We don't know what we're going to do. So we got a choice. It would be a growing, thriving community that might look and feel a little different than the one that came before. Or we can disappear. The world is changing. And while we're having fairly small conversations about fairly technical issues, or as Dr. Me pointed out, huge dramatic policy shifts at 1.30 in the morning, we're not talking about the things that are actually going to equip us to succeed in the future. I'm going to touch a little bit on voucher and charter expansion. Uh, I'll go, Dr. Meads, to hold thunder this one. <laughs> Here's the thing I want you to remember the most 96% of kids in Wisconsin that are publicly funded go to a school that is governed by a school board. 99% of the conversation is about the kids that don't. <coughs> right? On some level, that doesn't quite feel right. So if we look at all there's about a million kids in this country. There's about 870,000 of them are in public schools. There's about 100, 130, 120 to 130,000 that are in private uh, schools. And about a quarter of those are funded through a voucher program. The rest are private pay. So lots and lots of attention around a policy that's affecting ultimately a very small number of kids. Doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean it's not controversial. But if we got some proportional attention to the challenges about where most of our kids go to school, tackle some of our big issues. <clears throat> Dr. B talked about how the program grew over time. This shows the enrollment. There's the around it's 212, but that shows kind of what we were spending on it. And you can see these key points in the graph, right? So the core case that allows religious schools, there's different key points. Each one of those are usually changes in state policy. We lift the income cap, we lift the enrollment cap, we make a policy change, right? Dr. B pointed out that the Milwaukee program is now 300% of federal poverty. That's $77,000 a year for a married family of four. And the household income in Wisconsin is about $52,000. It's lower than that in Milwaukee, it's at forty-three. dollars So if it's a policy or program that's designed to serve low-income kids and give them better opportunities, but middle and upper class families have access to it, then it's not really an intervention anymore. Right? It's a universal opportunity. We're, we're changing the nature of what's going on in that conversation. And in the budget in which they raised the income threshold for vouchers to 300% of federal poverty, they dropped the income threshold for Medicaid or subsidized health care to 100% of federal poverty. So as a state, we made a policy decision. We wanted to make it easier for folks to get private school education, but harder for them to get health insurance. One of those is a constitutional guarantee. One, unfortunately, is not. But it, it has this kind of schizophrenic sense of, so what is our strategy about serving people and why is it so hard to figure out how we're going to take care of them? Because we seem to be moving in very, very different directions. When we talk about the enrollments of the schools, Dr. Lee makes an excellent point. 
So this graph shows the dark blue is the Milwaukee program, the kind of lighter blue is we're seeing, and the gray is the Milwaukee, uh, excuse me, the statewide program. The average actually dropped a little bit in terms of the percent of um, school kids in each school this year, in part because we have more schools adding into the program. But the narrative is very clear. Once a school enters the program, it slowly starts to march towards 100% voucher removal. And then raises, as a result, a whole host of policy questions about what's public, what's private, and where is this taking us. So let me do the universal math. Dr. Me mentioned the voucher in every backpack. That's my friend Terry Brown, School Choice Wisconsin's favorite line. I want a voucher in every backpack. Just sounds sense, doesn't it? And then Tim Shee didn't know the audience is thinking, no, we're not on the team. I know we're not on the team yet. So Tim Sheehy of the Milwaukee Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce says, I want funding parity with public schools. So let's just do the math. We're spending about 10000 bucks a kid on the revenue limit. And you know, there's about 93,000 private pay kids. Maybe they're on scholarship, maybe they're paying their own way, but who are not funded through a voucher currently. So what does it take to give every kid $10,000 on the voucher? Well, for 93,000 kids, the math is super easy. It's $930 million. When you catch up all the other kids, it's another 77. It comes up to just over a billion dollars. So do, do I have any math teachers in the room? I have a former math teacher over there. Don't <coughs> ruin the answer, but do we have a billion dollars? <laughs> Let me blow your mind for a minute. We had a billion dollars. It's several billion dollars. In fact, every state budget in the last few years, has had a uh, revenue growth of over a billion dollars. We've also had $2 billion in tax cuts in skyrocketing Medicaid costs, which we're not taking all the funding for. So we're making policy decisions that are constraining how much money is available, and then we're putting ourselves in a position where the theory of tax cuts is economic stimulus is supposed to generate more money because the economy grows. If the tax cuts don't generate enough economic activity, those tax cuts become education cuts. And I don't know that that's very good tax or education or fiscal policy. Okay, so that's the danger. Because I could be agnostic. If I spend a billion dollars to every kid to private school that wants to go, fine. Pay for it. And don't take it out of public schools. But that's not what's happening. Right? It's that strangling effect. So what's the state budget look like? When we look at the 10 largest programs, and that's what drives almost all the costs in Wisconsin, 80% 80, 80 of all the spending is in these 10 areas, the number one largest is K-12 public education. So it's hard to have a conversation in the state when you're not talking about K-12, medical assistance, UW is an ever-shrinking portion of this number. You know, and then we have this tax credit, which is fine because it's funding our property taxes, and that's perfectly reasonable thing for people to want to do, but let us not confuse that with funding for schools because schools don't actually see any of that money. Right? It just buys on the property tax them. Different, different interests. The other notable thing, if I were to give this talk, I don't know, two years ago or four years ago, the one thing that wouldn't have been on this chart that is, is the technical college system. So as Dr. B pointed out, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about how revenue limits work, but what happens in state policy is they can't control the property tax. It's not a state tax, it's a local tax. So what they do is they create revenue limits. Schools are under them, now municipalities, counties, technical college. Basically, anyone who can levy local taxes is under some sort of state control. And then they freeze them and give you more state aid. And that's how they reduce the property tax. But the reason we have school boards is because we have the property tax. Right? I mean, if we lived in Europe, we'd have a state run education system. Three o'clock every day, third grade, the French Reef of Bar, every school across the state or across the country. Or we can look at how Central America or Latin America does it, where many countries don't really have any what we would consider public education. They have private schools and maybe the state pays for some teachers and you go to school and you don't, and it's kind of up to you. We have this deep built system of local control, property taxes, decision making at the local level, right? They wrote this. Two drafts of the U.S. Constitution, right? The Articles of Confederation, when we create our own constitution, not to fund its education in. They said, you, the states, go figure this out. I mean, it is deeply embedded in our DNA. But slowly but surely, we're making decisions to take us further and further away from that very fundamental idea of how we operate. Now, my chart's a little different than Dr. B's, but I like to think of it as seventh grade algebra. A minus B equals C. A is the revenue limit, it's 
controls basically how the spending works. You minus out this day to day, that's telling me I got my 20 minutes up. And what's left is on the property tax. And then you have some other rates on the outside. So fundamentally, that revenue limit is the important control there. You can see what the change is over time. This is not the revenue limit, it's the change in revenue limit. So it grows and 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 then it grows a little less as the economy starts to slow down, but it still grows and then it drops. 5.5% across the state. Trying to be a high spending district, you lost a lot more, almost $1,100 a kid. If you're a low spending district, you lost a little less, like 400. The average was about 550 bucks a kid. And then it's starting to grow again. But we've never really caught up to where we were before. I mentioned we've lost 3,000 educators. Those are predominantly in areas that are non-core subjects, current <coughs> technical education, library media specialists, and all the things that make school fun. My kids want to go. And those are the areas where we have fewer staff. And she already shared the modified version of this chart, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But the thing that I think is notable about it is if you look back in 2011, our revenue limit was over $10,000. We are nowhere close to that. Almost five years later. <coughs> right? I mean, the, there are really profound changes that have been made in the last few years. She already shared with you the special education and by the way, cultural reimbursement rates. We know those are going down. The last point I'll make about this is what is going on our school referendum. So if you look over the last 20 years of revenue limits, overall we're passing 52% of school referendum. So it's almost a 50-50 proposition. Okay? And the type of referendum mattered a lot, actually. Um, the recurring ones passed at a much lower rate. But if you look just at the last three years, the pass rate is 64%. And there's a huge increase in what we're seeing voters decide to do. When the Marquette poll came out, it said 80% of voters supported increased funding on education, and 55% were willing to raise property taxes to put more money in schools. Those are like unheard of numbers in Wisconsin. So certainly we've had lots of conversation about how difficult it is and property taxes are high and how stressed everybody is about that, but it seems pretty clear that the electorate and the communities are moving past that. But the danger is, is that we're going to run into ballot box funding. Where if you live in a community where you can either afford or have the political will to pass a referendum, you're going to get to vote to fund your school. And if you don't, you're going to fall behind. And I don't know how that's a uniform, free, and appropriate public education for all kids. Right? So I'm not, the, Dr. B already kind of touched on all the budget stuff, so I'm going to kind of skip past all the delightful things that are included in the budget. Um, and there are a bunch of them that make changes to the report card on weighting and star systems. There are some flexibilities they include. You're going to have more choice on local assessments for reading and some other pieces. But let me leave you with a thought when I turn it over to uh, Representative Pope here. So this is Marcus. He's cute, right? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So he's about a year and a half old. And I'm pretty sure if I asked each of you to open your wallet, turn on your phone, you have pictures of your kids, your grandkids, your neighbor's kids, or some kid that's probably going to go to school in Wisconsin or does. And the decisions that we're making are going to have a really profound effect on all of these kids. So my ask to you is to stay engaged in this conversation because I need you to help change the discussion in the legislature so that I know that Marcus is going to get a good education. And I know that for all the kids that are in your wallets, they need you to be strong advocates for that too. So, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm happy to answer questions, and I'll let Representative Pope tell you about all the great things she's going to vote no on. Thanks. <laughs>